من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا so tonight we start with and, and I was thinking about how to title anything about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu anything about him falls short and so I thought the ultimate first uh, you think about someone who is um, you know you think about someone who is uh, quick to believe, quick to do any good, never hesitant with anything that the Prophet ﷺ asks of him, and also has a natural instinct towards good, it's always Abu Bakr. Now, I struggled because it's hard to piece what part of Abu Bakr's life عنه, to take for this, and I don't want this to become a biography or sira course. I want it to become something where we, you, we, we look at these people from the perspective of what it entailed to be sabiqun what it meant to be from those that were first, those that were always forerunners, those that were always preceding others to good. And so with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it'll probably take us two uh, classes, maybe three, to just go over that aspect of his life and what makes him so unique in the way that he is distinguished uh, within the books of seerah, within the books of biography. So. We'll kind of go to the very beginning of this. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is from a tribe called Banu Taym. Banu Taym. And Banu Taym is not one of those big tribes that you find in early uh, Mecca. It's not Banu Makhzum, it's not Banu Adi, it's not one of the, the, the major tribes, Banu Hashim. These are some of the big tribes of Quraysh that you often hear about. Banu Taym is a sub-tribe of Quraysh and it's a very small tribe. One of the good things about this tribe is that it's noble, it is uh, it has a reputation for not being combative, not being messy, not, not inserting itself into some of the tribal warfare that would take place. It has a good reputation as a tribe, uh, people that would generally uh, play the role of being peacemakers. Okay, so it has the nobility of a big tribe in Mecca, but at the same time it doesn't have the size, nor does it participate in the type of combat that a lot of the other big tribes in uh, Mecca participated in. And when you look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, you can often group them in tribes. The only two real notable tribes from Banu, notable people from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, from Banu Taym are actually Abu Bakr and Talha, two pretty big names. But those are the two notable names from this tribe of Banu Taym. And of course, all of Abu Bakr's family and all of Talha's family, may Allah be pleased with them, will come under uh, this tribe of Banu Taym. Now, Abu Bakr's actual name, what's Abu Bakr's real name? Abdullah ibn Abi Quhafa. What's Abu Quhafa's name? Abi Quhafa also is a kunya. Anyone know Abu Quhafa's name? So his name was Abdullah ibn Uthman. Abi Quhafa is Uthman. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Some of the narrations say his, his name prior to Islam was Abdul Ka'ba, the, the, the servant of the Ka'ba, and the Prophet ﷺ changed his name to the servant of Allah. And his father is Abi Quhafa, actual name is Uthman. Um, his mother is Um Khair, her name is the mother of good. SubhanAllah, it's like she was meant for this. Um, uh, Salma bin Sakhr radiallahu ta'ala anha, also would become Muslim actually pretty early on, the mother of Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr has a lot of interesting names and there are meanings to these names. Okay, there are meanings to these names for us to uh, take lesson from. Uh, who can tell me, and Abu Bakr, let's just put this out there from now. Abu Bakr means the father of what? What is Bakr? It's the young camel. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had a particular interest with the different types of animals that were there. Uh, he had a particular interest in raising camels and so his nickname became Abu Bakr. Usually if you have an interest in something or you indulge in something too much, they'll call you Abu, the father of that thing. So he's the father of the young camel. That became his nickname. And he would go by that for the rest of his life, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, there's also a nickname that he had, Atiq. Atiq. What does Atiq mean? The one who is freed. The one who is freed. And uh, typically speaking, many will look at this as a post-Islam name, meaning this was a name that the Prophet ﷺ uh, gave him. But if you actually look into the, uh, the, the history of Abu Bakr's name, it's actually a name that his mother 
called him. And the reason being is that Abu Bakr's parents, Abi Quhafa and Umm Khair, um, had, had trouble having a boy. They kept on miscarrying boys. So he had sisters, but he could not have, she could not have a boy. And so when Abu Bakr was born and he survived the, uh, the pregnancy, she called him Atiq, meaning he, he survived death. He was freed from death. Okay, so he was freed into this world. SubhanAllah, so there's some, a miracle even in his birth that his mother actually felt compelled to call him Atiq. And then after Abu Bakr uh, was born, she had another son. So she called him Mu'taqan. And then they had another son, so she called him Utaykhan, which is Tasghir, which is like a small Atiq. So they all ended up with those nicknames. So his name is Abdullah, but still Atiq, which is freed because he was freed from death and that he was allowed uh, to survive. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ took that name and he gave it another meaning. So Atiq is a name that preceded Islam, but it has a post-Islamic meaning that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ عَتِيقٍ مِنَ النَّارِ فَلْيَنظُرْ إِلَىٰ هَذَا Whoever wants to see someone who's been freed from the fire, then let them look at this one here. Let them look at Abu Bakr. Okay, so Abu Bakr was freed from death in coming into this world and then freed from hellfire on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. What are the characteristics of him? So he was born about two and a half years after the Prophet ﷺ. So two and a half years after the Prophet ﷺ, which would put his birth year at what? Let me keep, what is it? You can't say two. 570. Two, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was born 570. Abu Bakr anhu was born in the year five, approximately in the year 572. Um, he grows up in this noble tribe, very special young man. The characteristics of him sound very much so like the Prophet uh, He loved poetry. Abu Bakr anhu had a great love for poetry. But subhanAllah, he, he had an aversion to poetry that contained shirk, that contained polytheism even as a young man. So he loved poetry. Um, he was known to study ancestry. He knew the tribes, he knew where each person came from uh, without you having to spit into a cup and send it to somewhere that'll eventually be used to destroy you. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu could look at you, he could tell you where you were from, what you were from, who your great, great, great grandparents were, where this tribe mixed with this tribe. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had an incredible memory and an incredible understanding of the lineage of the Arabs extremely eloquent, um, extremely sharp, very, very smart. And he was, he, you know, he, he rose in the marketplace very quickly. So he was sharp and he was, he was brilliant at his trade. So he was a merchant, radiallahu anhu. And his sharpness uh, is what caused him to be very wealthy, very good at trade. And people loved to do business with him because he was very honest. All right. So uh, so there's actually an Arab that wrote a poem about him being, you know, uh, excelling in the marketplace, getting rich off of honesty. How few people get rich off of honesty. So his honesty gained him a reputation in the marketplace and trade, and he used to trade in garments and, and cloth, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So different types of fabrics and things of that sort. And that was what gained his reputation in the marketplace. Um, in his intelligence and in his fitrah, in his natural disposition, uh, he found idol worship silly. Okay, very early on. And so his father took him, Abu Quhafa took him to the Kaaba as a young man. And he, uh, he sat him in front of an idol, in front of one of the Aslam, and he said, uh, go ahead and worship it, I'm gonna go and I'll come back. Okay, so he left him there with the idol in front of the Kaaba. Just think of the image, right? Abu Bakr is a young man standing in front of the Kaaba, there are idols in front of him. He said, I'm gonna go, come back, you know, do some worship. So he looked at the idol and he said, um, Ya Rabb, he called the idol, oh my God, but, but in a way of testing it. He said, uh, I need some nice clothes, so clothe me. He looked around, nothing happened. Then he said to another idol, he said, I'm hungry, give me food. <laughs> nothing happened, right? So then he, 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 he kept on talking to them and he, he said, what is it with these? They don't talk, they don't benefit. And he said, if I pushed one of them, it would break. So he said, what, what type of God? It just it didn't click with him, even as a young man. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, 
took a stone and he looked at one of the idols and he said, I'm about to throw a stone at you. If you're a god, protect yourself. Threw the stone at the idol, it fell over. Abu Bakr anhu said, this is nonsense. So he completely abandoned idol worship. And, you know, uh, he practiced as, you know, he just, he just never worshipped idols. Similar to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, this is his best friend. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi never worshipped an idol. Abu Bakr never worshipped an idol. There's one more person who Aisha radiallahu anha says, never worshipped an idol or drank alcohol. Other than, I'm not talking about Zayd uh, radiallahu anhu or some of those others th- that were Hanif. They weren't hostile to, to idolatry. They didn't say anything or they weren't publicly preaching against it. But they didn't worship idols nor did they drink alcohol. So he said there were three. Or she said there were three. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi obviously, Muhammad, Abu Bakr, and Uthman. Okay, so these three never worshipped idols, nor did they drink alcohol. They found it to be counter uh, to their fitrah, to their na- natural intelligence, their natural goodness. And that incident of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu with the idols, what does it remind you of when you think of a prophet? Who does it remind you of? Is there an image that comes to your mind? It reminds you of Ibrahim, doesn't it? Ibrahim alayhi islam, right? This is Ibrahim Islam being put in front of the idols as a kid as well. And it's very interesting because Abu Bakr is nicknamed with the same title as Ibrahim, a siddiq the truthful one. He inclines towards the truth. There is sidq in, his, in, in him. There is a desire to the truth. There is an inclination to the truth. What is inside of him agrees with the truth naturally. So just like Ibrahim Islam, extremely intelligent, eloquent, you know, poking holes in idol worship, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is doing the same thing as a young man even in those moments. Now, when did Abu Bakr become Muslim? So there's, interest, there's some narration. So for example, there's Maymun ibn Mahran. He says that when the Prophet sallallahu went to Damascus, when we said the Prophet sallallahu went to Asham twice, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm always going to try to pull back other f- parts of this series so that you can keep on getting a full picture, right? The Prophet ﷺ went to Asham twice, right? When he went as a very young man, all right, who did he go with? Who took him to Asham the first time? His uncle, Abu Talib, right? And what happened when Abu Talib took him to Asham? Who saw him there? That's where the narration of Bahira, the monk, Right, who saw the Prophet ﷺ and who saw signs of prophethood in him, um, spoke of him and, 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 and praised him. So the narrations mention Abu Bakr was also part of that, that group. So Abu Talib was with the Prophet ﷺ as well as Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr grew up going to Asham. And if you read the seerah of Abu Bakr, so that narration, you know, there are different forms of it anyway. But Abu Bakr grew up going to Asham on an annual basis. This was his life to go to Asham and go to Yemen on the trade routes because he was a merchant. And he didn't have the constraints that the Prophet ﷺ had growing up. So Maymun ibn Mahrawi says that, the, that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, knew of what was prophesied of the Prophet ﷺ then and already had a feeling, right? Knowing that something, there was something unique about his best friend. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu also, um, you know, would, was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and would take or, or would spend private time with him, right? So he's seeing signs of his character. You can't spend that much time with him and not know there's something special about him, right? So that's why it would make sense then why Abu Bakr just clicked right away when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, I'm a messenger of God. It just immediately clicked with him. Right? He's been seeing the Prophet ﷺ in his alone time, in those private, in those private moments, uh, for so much time. Um, now, when did he become Muslim? Abu Hanif, rahimahullah, he says that the first woman to become Muslim was Khadija. The first youth to accept Islam was Ali. The first man to accept Islam was Abu Bakr. So that's how Abu Hanifa actually brought it all together. Okay? That Khadija was the first to accept Islam from the women. Ali was the first from the youth, Abu Bakr was the first from the men. Now obviously there is the situation of Waraqa, which we talked about, which is a very different and unique situation in and of itself, right? Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. But when the Prophet ﷺ went to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abu Bakr immediately told him, Sadaqtuk, I believe you. When the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr what happened, 
and his experience with Jibreel and Allah appointing him as a messenger of Allah, he immediately said, I believe you, right? So it was a complete buy-in. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu resembled the Prophet Sallallahu most in qualities, most in his character. And so, you know, some of the, the, uh, the scholars, they point out the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Mar'u ala dini khalili, right? A person is on the religion of his friends, is on the way of his friends. If these two were best friends, if you're the best friend of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for uh, 40 years, right, or 38 years, best friend from childhood, then obviously those characteristics uh, will we'll match. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he points to, he says, look at the description of Khadija to the Prophet ﷺ when the Prophet ﷺ came back to the house and Khadija comforted the Prophet ﷺ by mentioning his good qualities, the way that he treats his family, the way he treats his neighbor, the way he treats the poor, the way he treats the orphans, the way that he treated anyone that had a cause. And he said that was the way that uh, Ibn al-Daghina, who was a Meccan chief, when Abu Bakr was on his way to Abyssinia to make hijrah, to migrate, to escape persecution, Ibn Daghina stopped him and he took Abu Bakr to the different leaders of Quraysh and said, this is a person who should not be expelled. And he mentioned the exact same qualities about the Prophet ﷺ, about Abu Bakr, that Khadija mentioned about the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr is a copy of the Prophet ﷺ in regards to his character and in regards to the opinion that people had of him, except he was a chief of his people, he experienced wealth his entire life. And um, Imam al nawi rahimahullah said that one of the, the blessings of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu or something to think about is that as soon as the Prophet told him about who he was, about the religion coming to him, Abu Bakr did not think about his rank or his position or what would happen to him as a result of supporting the Prophet he immediately, he found the truth, he immediately accepted it, he immediately accepted the calling, and he knew that there were going to be serious ramifications to that. The Prophet ﷺ said, every single person that I invited to Islam, they had doubts at first, except for Abu Bakr. As soon as I invited him to Islam, as soon as I called him to Allah, he did not hesitate. He immediately accepted the religion and he believed in me and he supported me right away. Now obviously it's not including Khadija radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ is talking about on the outside of his household, right? That Abu Bakr believed in him right away and supported him right away and had absolutely no qualms about the types of ramifications that would come. But not only does he believe in the Prophet ﷺ, he builds the community around the Prophet ﷺ. So he doesn't, he doesn't just say to the Prophet ﷺ, I believe in you. He goes out and he starts calling people to Allah, calling people to the religion, and people start to convert right and left through the tongue of Abu Bakr. Remember, he was extremely eloquent, he had position, he had rank, people took his word seriously. And so think about this. He accounts for six, so, so there are the 10 promised paradise, al-Ashr al-Mubashirin, right? We'll go through all 10 of them, but we can start with uh, seven. Abu Bakr is one, and then he brought six others. Who else did Abu Bakr bring to Islam? Uthman, that's one. Talha, who is inseparable from Talha? Zubair, who else? Abdurrahman ibn Auf, who else? I heard, what is it? We said Zubair, there are two more. Abu Ubaidah al Jarrah. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Two of those six, okay, Uthman and Abdurrahman ibn Auf, were also of that same class as Abu Bakr, right? Wealthy, uh, elite in their tribal status, have a, have a certain word. So, uh, you know, Uthman and Abdurrahman ibn Auf are most similar to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them. Talha and Al Zubair are youth, right? They're young teenagers that come to Islam uh, through Abu Bakr. And of course, uh, Sa'ad and, uh, and, and Abu Ubaidah are from some of the respectable uh, members as well. So these six that he brought to Islam, other than himself, obviously being the seventh, these six that he brought to Islam make up with him seven of Al-Ashr al-Mubashirin, the 10 that were promised uh, paradise. So think about this, all of the good deeds of Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Uthman ibn Affan, all the wealth they spent, all the charity that they gave goes to the scale of Abu Bakr. 
So it's not just Abu Bakr's own sadaqah, his own charity. All of their charity is his. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who guides to good is like the one who does it without decreasing from the original doer in any way whatsoever. So every time you read a narration about the generosity of Uthman or Abd Rahman ibn Auf, Abu Bakr was cashing in on the good deeds of that. Those are all, that's all his sadaqah as if he gave that too. So consider his incredible generosity عنه, and then the two pools of Uthman and Abd Rahman ibn Auf, the three most generous people that spent on the Prophet وسلم, all stem from Abu Bakr Talha and Zubair, the neighbors of the Prophet وسلم, in Jannah, right? who defended the Prophet وسلم, who were always by his side, all of that goes to him. We talked about Islam going to China, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, that's Abu Bakr's da'wah. <laughs> Every person that the, the 30 million people that say La ilaha illallah in China stem from Sa'ad, that's all Abu Bakr's good deeds, right? I mean, think about the, the way that this all spreads and what this all means in terms of his good deeds. And it's not just them. Uh, Abu Salama, radiallahu anhu, Abu Salama is from the da'wah of Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was a noble man who of course passed away and Umm Salama, uh, radiallahu anha, would marry the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam after he passes away. So he brings in some of the most important people to Islam, all right? I'm talking about in terms of the elites and those that would give it respectability at that level. And then he goes with the Prophet Sallallahu to meet all of the different tribes as support. So he's always there with the Prophet Sallallahu when he goes out there to call people to Islam. Now was he tortured? Was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu actually going to be tortured? We know that the Meccans would make an example out of the weak and the poor. Would Abu Bakr be tortured? Yes. Who dared to torture Abu Bakr? This is where the picture starts to fill. Abu Bakr and Talha belong to Banu Tayn. They're noble. And the nobles would be reprimanded behind the scenes. They'd be beaten and reprimanded behind the scenes. They weren't going to be publicly humiliated the way that the slaves would be humiliated, the way that the poor would be humiliated. They would humiliate them privately and try to get them to renounce the religion privately because in their tribalism, <laughs> They did not want to humiliate their tribesmen in public because they would see that as collective humiliation of the tribe. So we can only do this in private. There was no one from Banu Taim. So the idea with the noble tribes was you take your noble ones and you punish them privately. Okay? Banu Taim, small tribe, no one was willing to torture Abu Bakr and Talha. Guess who takes the challenge to torture Abu Bakr and Talha? The brother of Khadija. <laughs> Nofal ibn Khuwaylid who was known as the Lion of Quraysh, Asadu Quraysh, the brother of Khadija, radiallahu anha, who, the, who was nicknamed because of what he did to the Muslims as Shaytan Quraysh, the devil of Quraysh. I gave a khutbah about him two years ago, I believe. Because it just, how could the brother of Khadija be such a horrible, evil man to even go out in Badr to try to kill the Prophet Wasallam? So the brother of Khadija, Nofal ibn Khuwaylid, takes a rope, he ties Abu Bakr and Talha together and he beats them and tortures them in private together with one rope. Crazy, right? SubhanAllah. I mean, the brother of Khadija torturing Abu Bakr and Talha. And that's why they were actually called Al-Qarinayn, the two tied ones, because Abu Bakr and Talha were tied together by the same rope of Nofal. Okay? So SubhanAllah, I mean, this is... When you start to dig deep into these things, you start to see it's all interconnected. Everything that's happening in the society is related to another part of the society and another dimension of the Prophet Sallallahu life. So Al-Qarinan, the two that are tied together, Abu Bakr and Talha, are bounded by the rope of Nofal, beaten and tortured only in private. Now, not beaten the way that the slaves were being beaten, not to a point of death, not to a point where they're not having their skin burned off of them. They're not having their, their nails pulled out. Some of the, the really harsh things that are being done to the slaves, they're not, that's not to that level, but it's enough to try to get them to renounce their faith. But it's all done, again, away from the public sphere. This isn't happening around the Kaaba because that would be a shame on the tribe itself. Okay? So Nofal ibn Asad, I'm sorry, Nofal ibn Khuwaylid um, tortures Abu Bakr and Talha. Now, this is probably, this next part, is probably the most underestimated dimension 
of Abu Bakr anhu's life and his good in the very beginning of Islam, which is the freeing of slaves. Abu Bakr is the emancipator of slaves early on in Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu freed multiple slaves. And obviously the most famous one is who? Bilal radiallahu anhu. The most famous one is Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Bilal is being tortured, humiliated, being made an example of. Bilal, how dare you? An Abyssinian black slave with absolutely no protection in a deeply tribalistic racist society, how dare you challenge Umayyah? Right? I mean, Bilal radiallahu anhu is, is doing everything. Basically, it's suicidal for Bilal to become Muslim. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu goes and says, I will purchase his freedom. Umayyah radiallahu anhu, who's making a, an example out of him, Abu Bakr says, how much? He says, seven, uh, seven uqiyas. And one narration, ten. Uqiyas are, that's a huge amount of money. A huge amount of money to free Bilal radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr says, deal. Gives him all the money takes Bilal. As Abu Bakr is taking Bilal, Umayyah wants to throw a comment. You know, he just tor- he almost tortured him to death. He literally had him under a stone, whipped, dehydrated. Bilal radiallahu anhu was barely alive. He's beaten to a bloody pulp. And as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is taking Bilal, Umayyah says, لو أعطيتني دينار. He could have given me one coin for him. He wasn't worth more than one dinar. For you, to, for you to take him. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Wallahi, if you would have said only a hundred uqiyas, I would have given it to you. I would have given you everything for Bilal. <laughs> so it, was, it, it wasn't just freeing these slaves, it was, it was something else. And Umar radiallahu anhu used to call Bilal our master who was freed by our master. Our master who was freed by our master. Bilal was our master, freed by our master Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, freed by... Uh, Abu Bakr, Amr ibn Fuhayra, freed by Abu Bakr. There are some women that were freed by Abu Bakr, female slaves that were freed by Abu Bakr. And it didn't matter what their status was or what benefit they would bring to this new Muslim community. If Abu Bakr heard that a a slave had become Muslim and was being tortured for that, he takes his money and he goes and he frees them. There was one one woman by the name of Zunayra, and she was beaten to blindness for becoming Muslim. So they beat her till she lost her sight. And subhanAllah, they said, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went to purchase her, a blind female slave, what use is she at this point, right? They said, ما أذهب بصرها إلا اللات والعزة. They said that the reason why she went blind is because of اللات and العزة, the two idols. So it was her insult of religion. It was the gods that took her sight. And when they said that, she said, Wallahi, ma tadur allat wal uzza wa ma tanfa'an. She said, I swear by God, allat and al uzza can't hurt anyone nor can they benefit anyone. This is a blind slave girl being pulled away by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And because of that, radallahu basaraha. She actually could see after that. So her sight actually came back to her. Some of these people you don't hear about. One that absolutely shocked me. SubhanAllah, I've taught the story of Abu Bakr multiple times and then I actually, because I, I, I'm trying to imagine the societal implications of this. One of the female slaves that Abu Bakr had freed was, was, was a woman by the name of Lubayna, who was the slave girl of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar was not a Muslim. Umar hated Islam. And when this particular slave became Muslim, Umar beat her until he would get tired. SubhanAllah, he said, I'm not stopping beating you because I pity you. It's because I'm tired. That's the type of wrath that she experienced from Umar before he became Muslim. And that was one of the regrets of Umar, right? That he beat someone like that for becoming Muslim. And Abu Bakr is the one who freed her, purchased her freedom. SubhanAllah, think about that. Who, who would have thought at some point the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr and Umar, Abu Bakr and Umar become the two sheikhs of the community, inseparable. And in this early day of Islam, Abu Bakr is the one purchasing a beaten slave from Umar radiallahu anhu to free her from his cruelty. So he is, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is going out looking for if he can hear the news of any one of these slaves. And this is a religion that started with the slaves, right? This is who Islam appealed to in the first place. The du'afa, the masakin, the weak, the downtrodden, the oppressed. This is where tawheed the idea of monotheism really appealed because they've been brutalized in the name of those idols. 
right? Abu Bakr is going out and freeing them. And subhanAllah, his father, who's not a Muslim yet, Abu Quhafa says to him, he says to him, oh my son, he said, people purchase slaves that are strong or healthy or have some sort of unique expertise that they can't get from anywhere else. Or they purchase a slave that would get everyone else in line, right? People purchase slaves for reasons. Why are you freeing these weak ones that can't even do anything for themselves? What's the point of freeing these slaves? What are these people going to do for you? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu responded, Ya Abi, inni la arju bi itqihim ma indallah. He said, Oh my father, I am seeking with their freedom what is with Allah. Guess what came down as a result of that? Surah Al Layl, which I was reading. Ibn Abbas anhu says the consensus that Surah Al Layl was revealed about Abu Bakr. This particular moment where Abu Bakr was freeing these slaves that no one else wanted, that everyone else beat. And Abu Bakr, anhu, and people start saying, like, maybe he's freeing Bilal because something happened in the past. They started to make up stories, right? Maybe, maybe there was some deal, some covenant, because it doesn't make sense. Why is Abu Bakr spending all of his money on these slaves, freeing all of these slaves? What's, you know, what are these women going to do for him? What are these men going to do for him? They have absolutely no benefit to the religion. And Allah responded to what Abu Bakr anhu said, Inni la arju bi itqihim ma Allah. I seek with, with, with their freedom what is with Allah. Wa ma li ahadin indahu min ni'matin tujza illa batigha'a wajhi rabbihi al-a'la wa la sawfa yarda. No one can compensate him for what he is doing. No one can compensate him for what he is doing. No one has enough money, enough power. Nothing could stop Abu Bakr. Could, could satisfy that craving that he had to free these people and to do this. Except for that which is with Allah, and Allah will certainly please him. Allah will certainly please him. Abu Bakr anhu, when he came into Islam, he had 40,000 dinars. By the time they made hijrah, he only had 5,000 left, and most of it went to these types of things. <laughs> I mean, at this time, you're not financing, in, in Mecca at this point, you're not financing any expeditions, any journey, journeys of the Prophet ﷺ, what's there to spend upon? There's no masjid, there's, there isn't much to spend fi sabirillah in Mecca. So out of his 40,000, uh, which he saved all of that time, he left with only 5,000 because of all of the money that he was spending, primarily on freeing these slaves. And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ recognized that there was something about the man spending very early on that he did not care about the implications of spending fi sabirillah. So Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu says ma, that the Prophet sallallahu said ma nafa'ni malun qat ma nafa'ni malu Abi Bakr that no money was ever more ever benefited me more than the money that was spent by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abu Bakr when he heard that he started to cry and he said hal ana wa mali illa laka ya Rasulullah Am I and my money for anything but you, O Messenger of Allah? Like Abu Bakr was embarrassed when the Prophet ﷺ would say that. Jabir radiallahu anhu and Abu Sa'id, they narrate that the Prophet ﷺ would spend from the wealth of Abu Bakr like he would spend from his own. Now that, that's not insulting. They had that type of a relationship where Abu Bakr's hand was free in spending on these good ventures, right? On these good things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ, would spend of it like it was his own money. They shared that. That's how close they were. And that was an honor for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to be respected and to be loved by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in such a manner. Now what happens as Islam starts to spread? Now Abu Bakr is first to believe in him from, from the men, right? And he's someone who has a unique position. He has clout, but it's not, it's not, it's not the type of clout that uh, Abu Jahal or, or Omar or some of the more powerful as in physically strong warriors are known for. It's a clout that comes through respectability, through his money, through his tribal, uh, you, know, uh, elite, you know, his tribe being elite. That's the type of clout that he has. He brings in the top tier of the Sahaba in regards to the economic and the tribal class, right? And then he brings in the lower tier. And I'm, and I'm saying that in quotes very intentionally because there's nothing low about 
Bilal and Khabbab and these people, right? But he's bringing in all these elements of society. He's building the community around the Prophet ﷺ. He's using his money to build around the Prophet ﷺ. He's financing Dar al-Arqam, everything that has to go with that. He's spending and spending and spending and spending. All of this in the da'wah is not public yet. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ has not actually publicly preached yet. This is all within small gatherings. But the Prophet ﷺ has not made the community-wide uh, call at this point. And obviously, as the community is growing around the Prophet ﷺ, there's a fear that this is going to get worse. Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, and this is actually narrated by Ali, Abdullah ibn Amr, and Aisha, that Quraysh were surrounding the Prophet ﷺ, and so they started to rough him up. Now this is where you see the gradual beating, humiliation of the Prophet ﷺ and his followers in public. So they were around the Kaaba one day, and they started to rough up the Prophet ﷺ. They started to push him. They started to pull his clothes. Um, Uqba bin Abi Mu'id slapped the Prophet ﷺ. So they're humiliating him. They're, 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 they're yelling at him. And they're saying to him, Anta ladhi ja'alta al-aliha ilahan wahida. You're the one who made all these idols into one God. You're that person. Mocking the religion of the Prophet ﷺ. And at this point, there's no Hamza. There's no Umar. There's no one that's really strong to go out there and support the Prophet ﷺ without getting themselves killed. All right? Now, Uqba bin Abi Mu'id, he escalated. When the Prophet ﷺ was humiliated after getting beaten and slapped around, the Prophet ﷺ started to pray. And when Uqba bin Abi Mu'id saw, remember Uqba is the one who would put the camel guts on the back of the Prophet ﷺ, he took his, his shawl and he put it around the neck of the Prophet ﷺ and he started to choke him. The Prophet gave an order that the Sahaba don't do anything. Even if provoked, don't respond. Because ultimately what they were looking for was a brawl and then they'd have an excuse to kill them all. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ was actually, it's, it's a strategic reason too. Right? Don't, don't respond, let them instigate, let them provoke, don't respond to this. Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu could not help himself. He heard about what was happening, he came to the Haram, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says the famous words, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجْلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ Allah." Will you kill a man because he says his Lord is Allah? Would you really kill a man because he says his Lord is Allah? Now Abu Bakr is not going and punching or anything like that. He's trying to protect the Prophet sallallahu And he's saying, would you really kill a man? Like what is wrong with you people? أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجْلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ Allah." Would you really kill a man? who would say that his Lord is Allah. That was enough for them to start pouncing on Abu Bakr and make an making an example of him. So they took Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, they rubbed his face in the dirt, and they dragged it in the dirt. So actually Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's face was covered, and then they punched him, punched him, punched him, until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lost consciousness. And they thought he might have died. They didn't want him to die because if you killed him, then that would be an another level of this, right? But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was beaten to a point of unconsciousness. Some of Banu Taym who were not Muslims, they saw that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was not moving anymore. So they went and they picked him up and they took him home radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the description of him, his face was unrecognizable because of the swelling. If you looked at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, you would not be able to see his face or you wouldn't be able to recognize him because of the swelling. Abu Bakr anhu had a very uh, sparse beard. He only had a few hairs on his face. Anhu. That's the description of him. And they said that the few hairs on his, on his face were covered in blood. And he looked, I mean, he looked lifeless. Anhu. So they started to treat him. And these are not Muslims. This is his tribesmen, right? That, didn't, that, that saw this as going too far. This was the first time a person's getting beaten like this. In the, you know, other than the Prophet Wasallam in the uh, proximity of the Kaaba. Abu Bakr's mother is treating him. Okay, like it's, you've got to understand the direness of the situation. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he wakes up and he says, Aina Rasulullah, where's the Prophet <laughs> He does not even ask, where am I? What happened to me? No sign of a lack of consciousness. Where is the Prophet <laughs> Where is the Messenger of Allah? They told him, relax. He said, not until I see the Prophet of Allah. So SubhanAllah, to stop him from asking about the Prophet of Allah, they had to carry him to the Prophet So he could see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, embrace the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
and uh, he embraced him for a long time. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates this incident. And he, he used to cry when he'd narrate the incident. Ali radiallahu anhu would cry when he, because he remembered, he was a young boy, he couldn't do anything. Right? Ali radiallahu anhu is a nine year old, a 10 year old, he can't do anything about this. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I swear by Allah that Abu Bakr is greater than the man from the family of Fir'aun who said, Would you kill a man who says, my Lord is Allah? And he said, do you know why that is? And the people said, why? He said, because the family of Pharaoh, the man who said that, hid his iman, he concealed his faith. He said, whereas Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu declared his iman openly before everyone, and there was a Pharaoh and Abu Jahl and those people that were there too, and he took the beating that came with that radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he said, by Allah, one moment in the life of Abu Bakr is superior to a thousand from the family of Fir'aun. Obviously not talking about Asiya radiallahu anhu, but talking about the man who Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, just like him, would you kill a man just because he said, his Lord is Allah. So his, his whole thing, right, is, is the Prophet okay? Is Rasulullah sallallahu okay? And that becomes the theme of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's life, or one extremely important element of the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that he puts the Prophet before himself in everything. He responds right away, and that's, that's a special characteristic. He doesn't, he doesn't take time, he doesn't hesitate, immediately responds. The Prophet sallallahu asks him for something, he responds. There's an opportunity to good, he responds. He's always there to respond. But there's also that selflessness, completely putting his, you know, his life on the line, everything that would come with being a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu And that shows in the Hijrah, obviously Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that uh, before the migration, she says that the Prophet Sallallahu used to visit Abu Bakr's house every day. Rarely would the Prophet Sallallahu fail to visit our house every day. Aisha is not married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi yet, right? So she's experiencing this as the daughter of Abu Bakr. She said he would come either in the morning or the evening, but it was rare that he would not come, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and alayhi salatu wasalam. So when the permission for the hijrah was granted, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was going to uh, take uh, his companions and flee to Yathrib, which would become Medina, said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, came to us at noon. And it was a time that he would not typically come. So we knew that something was up. Abu Bakr was waiting for the news of what the Prophet ﷺ was going to do with him, whether he was going to send him and the family out alone. He's waiting patiently to see what the plans of the Prophet are, alayhi salatu wasalam, to escape to al Madina. So he told Abu Bakr to just wait. And Abu Bakr is waiting, waiting, waiting. And so when the Prophet ﷺ came at that time, Abu Bakr anhu said, that this has to be something urgent. Right? He's coming at a time that he usually does not come. So the Prophet ﷺ asked permission to come in and the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, let no one else be in the home while we speak. This is a private matter. And Abu Bakr anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, they're only my two daughters, Asma and Aisha are in the room and that's it. Meaning they'll, they'll go to the side and it'll just be you and I that would talk. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, that I've been informed, that I've been given the permission to migrate, to do hijrah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, as ya Rasulullah, <laughs> your companionship, O Messenger of Allah, meaning do I get to come with you? Your companionship? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as Yes, the companionship, right? You'll get to be my companion. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu starts to shout in joy, crying, happiness, now, the Prophet ﷺ is the most wanted man in Mecca. Everyone's trying to kill him, right? There's literally uh, the biggest bounty that was known to the Meccans on his head. Every tribe is vying to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And he just told Abu Bakr, you get to be with me in the middle of the desert while people come and try to find me and kill me. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I, when I saw my father cry like that, she said, Lam, uh, you know, she, she, said, she said, I didn't think like that people actually cry out of joy. It was weird to think of someone crying out of joy, right? Crying to me was reserved as an emotion for sadness. She said, 
until I saw my father cry that particular moment. The way that Abu Bakr cried out of joy, ya Rasulullah, I get to come with you, I get to come with you, was something that I had never thought was possible from any person. Anhu. Abu Bakr anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, I've got two camels prepared, they're ready to go. And I'll offer one of them to you, the Prophet said, I'll only take it if I pay for it. So no, I'm not going to take my camel for hijrah from you as a gift, I'll pay for it. And so the Prophet made that condition and they went out anhu Abu Bakr appointed Asma who was older and Abdullah to help them in the hijrah. And the freed slave, Amr ibn Fuhayra. Amr ibn Fuhayra was known for being a guide. So Amr ibn Fuhayra is one of those that was freed by Abu Bakr anhu. So he would be the guide of the Prophet and Abu Bakr, cover their tracks. Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr, would listen to the news in Mecca and bring it to them on that journey. So coordinate points with them. And Asma anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, would carry the food to the Prophet and to Abu Bakr anhu. Uh, when they went out in the hijrah, and I'm going to have to end within the next few minutes, inshallah ta'ala, so this is probably a good stopping point. But when they went out in the hijrah, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did something strange. Right? They'd be walking, and then he'd go in front of the Prophet And then he'd go behind the Prophet And then he'd go to his left, and then he'd go to his right. And the Prophet is looking at him like, what are you doing? Why do you keep on switching? Spots, And he said, Ya Rasulullah, every time I think about the potential of someone coming from this direction, I go to that direction. So I think about someone might be coming from this way, so I go to this way. Then I think someone might be coming from this way, so I go to that way. So he's circling the Prophet Sallallahu even as they're walking on this journey to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, that's where they enter into Ghar Thawr. Has anyone ever been to Ghar Thawr, like inside of it? It's hard to get up there. It's, uh, Hira is a lot easier. Ghar Thawr is a tiny, tiny, tiny cave. Meaning it can fit two people and that's it. Uh, if you stick your, if you extend your legs, it can only fit one of me, all right? Any, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny cave. I mean, it hurts to actually get inside of Ghar Thawr. And it's, it's, it's very, very private, very hard to find. And you'd have to, I mean, you'd have to look for it, but at the same time, like the idea that the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr were there and Quraysh came to the foot of that cave, subhanAllah, when, you're, when you actually go there, it's a crazy thought. Because literally, if they would have looked, you, it wouldn't take but one foot, right? And you'd see their limbs, you'd see the, the leg of Abu Bakr or the leg of the Prophet ﷺ. So you imagine, they're hiding out in this cave. And while they're hiding out in this cave, before they're found, something happens. The Prophet ﷺ fell asleep, and they're crunched up. Abu Bakr who noticed that a scorpion was coming in through the cave. He put his foot on the hole, and he let the scorpion pierce away at his foot to protect the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ woke up by his tears. Right? I mean, he couldn't hold his tears from the pain of that scorpion drilling into his foot anhu, protecting the Prophet Then they're there and of course, those that are trying to kill the Prophet some find him. They get to the mouth of the cave. And if you're there, you're thinking, that's it. It's been a good life. Alhamdulillah, we came this far. There's no way you're getting out of that, right? But of course, Allah protected with the nest and the birds that were there that suggested that, there, that, that you know, there was no one inside, as well as the spider web, according to some of the narrations. And they didn't even think to look down because of the spider web and because of the birds, right? So why would anyone, or how is it possible that there would be a fully formed spider web and the birds that would be there and the nest that would be there if there, were two, if there was a human being that was in there? So you imagine those moments where you're looking at the feet of these people and you're sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu and the love that, the, that Abu Bakr had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the sense of duty that he had to protect him all that time. And you're looking at those feet. And in those moments, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu starts to shake. He's scared, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu says to him, مَا ظَنُّكَ بِثْنَيْنْ اللَّهُ ثَالِثَهُمَا He said, oh Abu Bakr, what do you say of two people and God is the third? Don't worry. We're okay, right? 
لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't worry, Allah is with us. Why are you worried? Complete, complete tranquility that the Prophet ﷺ had. Now, is Abu Bakr worried about himself or is he worried about the Prophet? He's worried about the Prophet ﷺ. He's not worried about himself. He had no care for himself, right, in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in the Quran. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah mentions when the two were in the cave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of them said to the other, meaning the Prophet said to his companion, لِصَاحِبِهِ By the way, that's another distinction. Allah called him his companion. لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا Don't worry, Allah is with us. So Allah revealed his tranquility upon him. Who's the tranquility coming down upon? Abu Bakr. That's who it's speaking about in this moment. So Allah speaks about this in particular it coming down on Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then I'll end with this moment from the hijrah insha'Allah ta'ala. They get out of the cave, they make their way to Medina, and on the way now, because the cave, you know, the ghar is, is actually not very far away from Mecca, right? It's right out on the outskirts of Mecca. They hadn't really started the journey yet. But now they're on the way. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet وسلم, had not had anything to eat or drink for days. Asma radiallahu anha is not able to reach them at this point. They're in the midst of the journey to Medina all by themselves. And they walk into, they find the home of a woman on the way by the name of Umm Ma'bad radiallahu ta'ala anha. Umm Ma'bad didn't know who they were. Bedouin woman that had a house somewhere in the middle of nowhere, right? Between Mecca and, uh, and, and Medina. And they go in and she sees these two travelers who are in need of some something, right? Some something to eat, something to drink. They are dying of thirst at this point. Umm Ma'bad gives one of the most beautiful descriptions of the Prophet So it's a long description describing his beauty, describing his grace, describing, so I never saw a man like this in my life, right? Describing the Prophet and then uh, the Prophet ﷺ asked, do you have any goat or sheep or anything to milk? She said, I've got this one that doesn't give any milk. That's what, that's what I have right now. The Prophet ﷺ said, bring it here. Prophet ﷺ says, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And he rubs its udders and it starts to give milk. The Prophet ﷺ takes a cup of that milk. He first offers it to Abu Bakr. He says, Ishrab ya Abu Bakr, drink o Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr says, no way, you first. Prophet ﷺ drinks. Abu Bakr is looking at him. He says, Ishrab ya Abu Bakr. He said, no, you keep drinking. Prophet ﷺ drinks. He says, Ishrab ya Abu Bakr, drink Abu Bakr three times. Insisted on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr says, Ishrab ya Rasulullah, drink O Messenger of Allah. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, Fashariba al Habib hattar tawait aw hatta rawitu. I looked at him drinking and he drank until I was full. <laughs> Like that's actually the sentence. Until I was full. Like once I, when I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi drinking and I saw him nourishing himself, I wasn't thirsty or hungry anymore. Right? It was literally that type of a connection. His thirst is my thirst. His nourishment is my nourishment. His sickness is my sickness. His healing is my healing. His pain is my pain. His joy is my joy. Everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi goes through, that's how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu views life, living through uh, that with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, I want to end with, uh, or actually, you know what, I'll leave this for next time. I'll end on that note, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we might need three for this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to grant us that love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to grant us that selflessness, and to reward Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu for all of those people that he freed for the sake of Allah or brought to the, for the sake of Allah to this religion that we all benefited from. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannatul Firdaus. Allahumma ameen. I'll go ahead and I'll take questions inshallah. Yes.